Hi, I'm Dr. Fred Tiesinga, and I'm the co-director of the Chicago Institute of Advanced Bariatrics. And I'm Dr. Rami Lutfi. I'm a co-director of the Chicago Institute of Advanced Bariatrics. So today we're really going to be talking about weight loss surgery and who would be a great candidate for weight loss surgery. We're going to begin by talking about obesity and what really is it. And obesity is really an excess in your weight that results in an impairment in your health. So what this is really coming down to is talking about your health and really who is a good candidate for weight loss surgery. And because we are all not the same height, uh, we, instead of using our weight, we use something called body mass index, which actually calculate how big a person is. It's a simple formula that people can just uh, go on the internet and go look for their body mass index entering their height and weight. Uh, the number, the magic number we look for is 35, um, which, above which uh, morbid obesity occurs. Yeah, I think it's always interesting because sometimes our patients say, well, you know, I'm just big boned or, you know, I'm just vertically challenged. But really, we can tell mathematically who is a good candidate for the surgery and who isn't. And the number 35 didn't just uh, come out of nowhere. There are a lot of studies that showed that uh, with increasing weight, um, the health-related issues increase, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and really the mortality. We have very good evidence that show us now that obese people, uh, rather morbidly obese uh, patients, especially once their body mass index go over that magic number of 35, they do die earlier. Yeah, I think it's also interesting that we often meet with patients and primary care doctors and they say, well, you know, my patients can lose their weight with a diet. You know, they don't need to do something drastic like surgery, but we're really realizing that surgery really isn't drastic. It's the only thing that's really effective. Most diets have approximately a 5% success rate which translates to a 95% failure rate. So that's not really something that you want to bet your life on. And you know, what's, uh, what's interesting about this is that we surgeons uh, don't say that uh, just you have surgery, you become thin. This is uh, really a tool that uh, we help patients basically feeling satisfied after eating little. Really behavioral changes, exercise, and watching what we eat is the mainstay for any meaningful treatment. What we do in surgery, we simply uh, make the stomach, for the most part, majority of the operation, make it the stomach smaller. So when you start losing weight, 20, 30, 50, 70 pounds, and it becomes much more challenging to continue to lose weight and you'll be starving, with surgery where the stomach is smaller, people can eat little and be satisfied. So they're not miserably hungry and they rebound and regain all their weight plus. This is the, what we call the yo-yo dieting, which probably most of you who are watching this uh, have been through frustration of going down, regaining more, going down, regaining more, right? Yeah, I think that uh, most studies show that people that go on diets actually gain weight. So it's a good way to gain weight going on a diet. Yeah, and surgery is uh, pretty much a very simple concept. In the 70s and 80s, uh, you know, especially as we try to do these surgeries with the minimally invasive um, uh, fashion, which, co which we call laparoscopy, uh, you know, there were, uh, these things were very major because we didn't know how to do it. We didn't have the tools, we don't have the technology. But now surgery is pretty simple. We do most of our surgery um, uh, as outpatient, uh, where patients go home either same day or one or two days at the hospital and now we do about 50% of our surgeries using what's called single incision surgery, which is just little cut through the belly button, achieving uh, this whole operation. So the risk of surgery, and that, like Dr. Tiesinger said, it, the, uh, it's not drastic. The risk of surgery is becoming much less than the risk of carrying your weight throughout your life. Um, uh, and we have shown that people who do have surgery uh, live longer than those who are the same weight and do not have surgery. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that uh, a lot of times people think it's really risky to get surgery, but it's actually more risky to not get your surgery. So you're going to live longer if you get the surgery. 
I was thinking about the medicine of surgery, and I think that in the past, uh, weight loss surgery has been, you know, thought of as being really risky. And I think the science has really caught up with with the surgery at this point, and we're getting much better outcomes than in the past, and we're doing really a, a rather safe operation. And you know, it speaks a lot when you think about it, safer than not getting the surgery. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, you know, a few uh, weeks ago, it's been all over the news, the studies from uh, Cleveland Clinic from Italy where they looked at diabetes. Uh, most, right. uh, not most, but a very good portion of our patients obviously have diabetes as uh, the type two diabetes as a result of their um, size and their uh, obesity. And uh, they pretty much randomized people between surgery and no surgery, which is the way to get very high level evidence. And uh, at least at the Italian study, they showed that people who had surgery versus those who didn't, but had optimal medical care, 75%, uh, about three quarters uh, of, the, of those patients pretty much normalized their blood sugar, had remission of their diabetes, as opposed to zero of the patients who went into the medical arm, which is again, optimized medical therapy, not those who chose to do nothing. So surgery cures diabetes in the majority of patients. This is peer reviewed, um, articles, this is pure science, not just something that we talk to patients about. Yeah, I think, you know, think about that again. Sometimes you need to hear something more than once. People that tried to just go on a diet in this study, zero percent, zero percent of them became non-diabetics. People that had surgery, three quarters of them. And they watched them, right? The, the, the people who went on diet, they just didn't do it on their own. The, this was uh, patients who were followed by doctors and they had optimal care, right? Right. Okay. And you know, the, the surgery, as Dr. Tissinga said, you know, now we do surgery because of the improved technology and because of the years uh, for surgeons trying to optimize their technique, uh, it's just uh, becoming something that uh, um, is much less dramatic. Recovery is faster uh, when we do surgery with a camera, with a laparoscope, with a minimally invasive technique and uh, pretty much most surgeries um, are a, um, they involve just helping patients eat less and feel satisfied. Yeah I think that's one of the big differences between being on a diet and getting an operation. When you have a diet you're like trying to like not eat even though you're starving and that can work for like a week or two or three or four but it won't work long term. These surgeries they make you feel full so you don't want to eat so it's a completely different concept. So maybe we should talk about some of the surgeries yes. we do since yes. we've been talking and, and about it. As we, as we introduce this, it's very important to reemphasize about not wanting to eat because we learned last uh, uh, maybe 10, 15 years that uh, the uh, hunger is just not just simply an emotion like falling in love. You know, hunger is a, uh, controlled uh, by very complex networks of hormones and many of our operations that we do now we realize that they changed the way our brain seeks food and and that is something that we learned like I said last decade or so where we remove this part of the stomach or we bypass part of the stomach and we see when we look at blood samples in our patient that the hunger hormones the hormones the chemicals that make us want to seek food they go down we do four different types of operations here at the Institute. We do gastric bypass, we do the lap band, we do sleeve gastrectomy, and most recently, Dr. Lutby has been doing uh, gastric plication, which he'll tell you a little bit more about as we go. It's important to know that all these operations are done with a laparoscope. You go home in a day or two after any of these operations, and they all are relatively safe. Yeah, and you know, we, we uh, put a lot of effort at the Institute to renovate our surgical suite, uh, putting together all the necessary equipment to do this operation with a camera. We do have uh, also now the ability to do robotic surgery. Uh, some of these operations are, doing ro uh, are being done robotically, which also minimizes trauma and increases the ease of this operation, which means uh, faster recovery. Yeah, I think here at the Institute we're really pushing the edge um, and uh, making a lot of new uh, advancements in surgery and really kind of pushing the edge of innovation laparoscopically and I think you know, that's kind of been, been interesting. Yeah, no, it's been uh, great to see the evolution of bariatric surgery over the last 15 years which we lived but even here at the Institute going from doing regular laparoscopy with the majority of 
the uh, surgeons do to doing single incision surgery, to doing robotics, and now doing innovative operation like the plication. Do you want to talk a little bit about the band and the bypass, and maybe we'll start talking about sleeve? Sure. The, uh, the, the gastric bypass has for a long time been thought of kind of as the gold standard. It's been around the longest of all the operations, and it's a restrictive operation and a malabsorptive operation. So we're actually cutting your stomach and making it about the size of a shot glass and then bringing up a loop of a small bowel to it so it is restrictive and malabsorptive. Uh, and again, that's kind of thought of as the gold standard, the one that's been around the longest. The lap band was FDA approved in June of 2001 and that's an operation that's just restrictive and it's like a band around the top of your stomach, kind of like around the neck of your stomach. And it's got a balloon on the inner diameter of it and that can be adjusted so that you can adjust how much fullness you feel when you eat. And I think it was very uh, appealing, uh, f at least I saw, and I'm sure you did, um, and you may want to talk about this, the fact that we don't cut stomach, we don't do any drastic changes in the anatomy, and this was the appeal in the early 2000s behind the band. Did you see that patients wanted this? Yeah, I think that when I started doing the band, you know, mostly everybody was getting a bypass then. You know, now the band has gotten a lot more popular for mm -hmm. people that just think about safety. A lot of people think it's safer than going to the bathroom, getting a lap band, which is an odd thing to think about. Well, it depends on your bathroom, where right. it's located. Sure. Uh, but yeah, we, we, and especially the band, we applied this uh, new technology that uh, I know that Tertisinga was one of the first uh, surgeons in the region and the nation to do the single incision surgery, uh, placing the band through a small incision in the belly button and at the end, you know, you tuck the belly button, if you will, uh, and, and you'll never have a scar. Uh, so, and we started to apply this technology uh, to different bariatric operations like sleeve gastrectomy where we do the same technology. Uh, I think the sleeve, um, you know, at least I look at it and uh, many people probably don't, don't agree. It's kind of in between the band and the bypass and, and uh, you know, when, when I talk about uh, surgery to my patients, I say, like Dr. Tiesinger said, the bypass is the gold standard, then the band was appealing because there's no cutting. Uh, but the band kind of lacked the metabolic changes, those changes in the hormonal uh, network that control our hunger. And uh, we looked for something that is not as drastic as a bypass, uh, but also uh, causes the metabolic changes that we saw in the bypass as opposed to the band that lacks these. And, and, and this is where the sleeve gastrectomy came, which is really simply, all we do is we take the redundant expandable part of the stomach that allows us to eat more than we need to when we're hungry, starving, we eat and eat and eat and our stomach expands. So what we do is we simply take that expandable part of the stomach and the stomach will be shaped as a thin tube, just like a sleeve. And that's where the word sleeve come from. Although most of my patients call it the banana operation because if you uh, look at the internet, it looks like a banana. Um, and, and, and that helps uh, the patient in two ways. It's the stomach is smaller, so restrictive part of the operation, but also metabolically, when we remove that part of the stomach, uh, um, patients don't feel as hungry. Do you, do you see that in your patient as far as the drive to want to eat? Yeah, I think people that get a sleeve gastrectomy sometimes have um, almost a low grade of nausea for a little while, and they are a little resentful when that goes away, because it does eventually go away. Um, I think the nice thing about a sleeve is that you don't have to adjust it. With a lap band, you have to get adjustments done. Uh, the good thing about a band, the good thing about a band is that you can adjust it. Uh, the good thing about a sleeve, you don't have to adjust it. The bad thing about a sleeve, you can't adjust it. So there's good and bad to all these operations. And I think that's, that's what uh, make a lot of our patients happy when they come here because there's just a bunch of operations. Uh, some people don't want to have the foreign body. Some people don't like to uh, come for adjustments. We get a lot of people from out of state, a lot of people fly in. They don't want to keep coming to us uh, for adjustment. And uh, at the same time, a lot of people watch too much TV and they think every time we cut their stomach, my God, something major. Remember, when you think about this, when there is colon cancer, when there is a twist in the intestine, need to remove an organ because of a disease, we cut all the time. Uh, cutting uh, 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 certain diseased organ are, is very safe. Now we do surgery very, very safely. Now the stomach, when we divide stomach for sleeve, is a normal stomach, so cutting will be even safer. So uh, we're seeing very low uh, um, 
complication, but complication do occur. And for those patients who worry, so they, who like the sleeve idea, but worry about the fact of cutting, there's this new option that we're very excited about called the plication, where simply, instead of dividing the stomach, getting rid of that redundant part, we just simply fold it in. I call it stomach tuck, you, where, where you take that redundant part and you just tuck it on itself, fold it in, and it just looks, again, like a sleeve, but instead of it being a divided sleeve, it's just the redundancy is just tucked in. And that just gives a new option. It is an investigational procedure. Our patients who elect to have it, uh, they, they, uh, they come to our research uh, part and, and, and we go through the, uh, the, the, the operation and have them understand that this is not a standard. But as Dr. Tissing has said, we like to be very innovative. As, as long as we're very safe, we're very innovative here. Yeah, and you know, I think that's one of the things that sets us apart at the Institute because you know, we're, really, we're not a one-trick pony. You can come here and you can get a bypass or a band or a sleeve or even a plication if you want to. Some centers, they just do bands or they just do bypasses or they just do some other surgical option. And I always tell patients, you know, unless there's a good reason why I think you shouldn't have one or the other, I want to do the operation that you are planning on having. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 uh, risks. People talk about risk, and they want to know what the risks are. And 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 this is uh, uh, also not only the the operation, but also the risk of surgery. Let's just talk a little bit about um, these uh, risks uh, of surgery, because we want to be very clear about what could happen, what could go wrong, because that's a big part of our decision. Two things before I let Dr. Tisinga kind of talk more about it. Two things very important. We are operating on people who are sick. The, the idea that, oh, you're just big, but you look good. This is not, we are not plastic surgeons. You know, my mom still tell, tells her friend that her son is plastic surgeon for some reason, but uh, uh, we are not plastic surgeon. We are doing this because we believe we are saving lives. Uh, obesity is kind of like smoking. You can smoke all your life and say, you know, my uncle smoked all his life and he lived until he's 100 years old, and my dad never smoked and had lung cancer when he was 50 years old. We can say that, but we do know that smoking uh, leads to problem. Obviously, it's the same thing. As you get older, you get bigger, your knees hurt, your, your back hurt, you start being less mobile, less ability to play with your kids, with your grandkids, uh, heart disease, lung disease, sleep apnea, and so forth. So when we talk about risk of surgery, we have to remember that we are operating on people who are sick, and that's why we're doing this. And, and um, the, the uh, uh, risk of not having surgery, we have shown very clearly in scientific uh, research, uh, it's more. Now, when we look at complications, I, I believe most complications happen because of our patient population when they get really, really big with severe illnesses. Uh, these are more of a medical risk related to their own uh, body. This is why here at the Institute we work very closely with your primary care physician or if you don't have one, we have a primary care doctors here that are interested in obesity and obesity related illnesses that will work with us uh, here at the Institute or like I said with your primary care physician if outside to optimize your health so you are at the best you can be to have surgery and cruise through it and have good recovery. Uh, as far as the complications that are technical, they depend on the operation. Yeah, and, and I think, Rami, that you know, we want to be straight with people. You know, this mm -hmm. isn't a for sure safe operation to get. Something, you know, bad things happen to nice people. They happen all the time. But I think in general, you have to remember that it's safer to get the surgery than not to get the surgery. You're going to live longer with the surgery than without the surgery. And, and it's very important uh, to that point. Uh, and I tell my patients, a lot of them, they go, you know, we in Chicago, we have five universities around us and we have a lot of options. It's a major city. And I tell my patients who come here, who've been shopping around, wherever you go, uh, two things. You have to be comfortable with the surgeon, but it's really not only the surgeon. We do, we, we get the glamour because I think we do the risky part, but it's very important to have a program, to have a nurse 
to have staff because we're operating a lot of time. It's not easy to get us immediately on the spot. And, and I think we take very much pride with our comprehensive uh, program that we have. We have a nurse, we have a nurse practitioner, medical assistant, people at the front desk who pick up your phone calls. So when you're nauseated, when you don't feel good, when you're scared for any reason, when you just think there is something wrong, even if there is nothing wrong, you know, uh, there's someone where you can come uh, five days a week or on weekends to the emergency room because we are, the institute is at a real hospital with 24-7 emergency room. You can come and say what's wrong with you. So this is not just uh, Dr. Tissinger and myself just operating on people and just walking away. Uh, so any of these issues, any of the warning signs, there is somewhere you can call. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we're talking about there's a reason why people are getting these operations, whether it's diabetes, high blood pressure, joint pain, urinary incontinence. And the important thing to remember is these operations, they help to cure all of these comorbidities, we call them. There's studies now for diabetes, and that one that Rami quoted, where 75 or 74 percent of people got off of all their medication for diabetes and had a normal hemoglobin A1C. So that's pretty much cured. In one study, uh, 50 to 70 percent of people got off their blood pressure medicines completely. So that's cured. And when you think about it, when you've been going to your primary care doctor for the last five years, and every year you get told to go see the dietitian, and every year you get a new medication given to you because you've just gained another 20 pounds and it gets to be kind of defeating this is something that actually works yeah you know, you know um, sleep apnea a lot of my patients just love it you know they say we don't have to sleep anymore with that mask, that mask on our cool, face though, yeah <laughs> well it makes a nice sound those yeah. new masks they, yeah. they do make a nice sound but, uh, you know, the, the, I think the transformation as far as disease and as far as quality of life, it's funny. You get so much stories. I, I think one of our patients just asked us to make a video for us. He's just uh, so um, uh, enthusiastic about surgery. And he had surgery. And, uh, and uh, th 30 years uh, after the f w w he went last to the Cubs game, uh, you know, he was able to go again to a Cubs game. He saw me. He didn't even think. Um, weight loss surgery existed. He's a young man in his uh, late 40s, I think, and uh, bad knee disease, and he had to change both his knees. Luckily, the orthopedic surgeon uh, said, you know, your knees are just pretty much bad and they have to be changed, but, you know, uh, they're not going to carry your weight, so you need to lose weight. And, and he came to us, and, you know, when I saw him last, he came and he hugged me, and he was about uh, uh, 200 or 180, 190 pounds, and he said the best thing that ever happened to him is that he went after 30 years to uh, watch the Cubs game. He was able to fit in the seat. They still lost. Nothing really changed about the, you know uh, baseball, but uh, but uh, he was able to sit. He was able to feel normal. Uh, uh, patients tell me things that I never really think about. Patients say, for the first time, we were able to tie our shoes. We can never buy shoes with shoelaces. Right? Don't you hear stories like that? Yeah. You know, I, I think the case for bariatric surgery is a compelling one. I think that it's safe, it's effective, and it really works and changes people's lives. Yeah, I, I, I totally uh, agree. And this is why we're pretty much give, betting our uh, life on it. You know, we gave many years of our life to fighting obesity and uh, kind of defending our patients because there's definitely a lot of prejudice um, uh, idea against obese people. Uh, people stand them that they're lazy, they don't want to do anything. But this really, uh, we do understand our patient. They want to get up, they want to move, but they're back hurt, they're knee hurt. So that vicious cycle of the bigger I am, the more depressed I am, the more my knee's going to hurt. I cannot walk, so I'm going to sit at home, get even bigger with more pain. So we try to break that vicious cycle. And a lot of our patients, they lose so much weight before surgery because they're so much into it now. And they just, just, just trickle and just continue to lose and lose and lose. Yeah, I, I think it's something that nobody plans on. Nobody <laughs> plans on being you know, 40 years old and being 380 pounds and having to hold their breath when they tie their shoe or getting stuck in their bathtub. or You, know, you just name the things. It happens very slowly. And a lot of our patients just finally say they woke up one day and they said, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to have diabetes and back pain and sleep apnea. And every time I hear a funny joke, I pee in my pants. And they decide they're just going to take control. And that's it. It's like an epiphany one day. And all those things, as odd as they sound, they can all be turned back. And it's really, it's kind of fun to watch. 
It is fun to us. There's nothing like the aftercare clinic where pe people come back and talk to us. Uh, you know, they don't like me to be so much in the support group. They like to, our patients, they like to sit together and talk with our dietitian. Uh, and, and, and they don't like the surgeons uh, to be there. Every once in a while I sneak in and I see the stories and they're great. Uh, we really think we make a difference. Um, so if you, if you are interested, uh, let us know. Uh, we're here. We have a lot of very good staff that just, uh, that's what they do for a living. They talk to big people and they know the problems. Whatever problems you have, we probably heard it and understand how bad it is. So just let us know. Dr. Tissinga and I, this is, we're here. This is what we like to do, right? Yeah, sure is. Thanks for listening. Thank you.